This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hi, and welcome to Self Work. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm a clinical psychologist out of Fayetteville, Arkansas, and I've been doing this podcast about three years now. I want to reach the people who are very psychologically motivated. I want to reach people who might have been initially diagnosed with depression or anxiety and are searching for answers. And I want to help those of you who might never darken the door of a therapist, but are just curious enough to give someone like me a listen. I want to quickly ask those of you who might have been meaning to do this but just haven't yet to leave me a review on iTunes. It really helps to spread the word about the Self Work Podcast. But on to the topic of the show. We're going to talk today about sexual abuse, so please know that listening to this may trigger you in some way if you have any abuse in your history. I'll have the hotline numbers to both the UK and the US sexual abuse hotlines in the show notes, so please take care. The topic we're actually going to cover is when people who have been abused reveal that they have and they're not believed. I'll use some case histories from my own patients, obviously anonymously, so that you can hear from them how hard it was not to be believed or actually for the abuse to be covered up intentionally. We've all heard about the USA Gymnastics team and actually the Indianapolis Star did a Huge investigation and discovered a pattern of coaches and others failing to report sexual abuse to authorities. And they actually uncovered more than 360 cases spanning 20 years in which gymnasts were accusing coaches of sexual misconduct and nothing was done. And in fact, the problem was kept from view. We'll also touch briefly on the reasons that men as in gender have struggles in revealing sexual victimization, and hear from a major soccer star about his own fight with suicidal thoughts after being victimized by his coach and mentor. Our listener email today is from a young woman who's identified with perfectly hidden depression, but doesn't know how to begin to look for a therapist and how to reveal that she's been hiding. If you're not new to the podcast, you know that I've written a book on perfectly hidden depression that is now available. And if you're new then you might check out the many episodes on Perfectly Hidden Depression because it's about how perfection can cloak actual clinical depression and can be extremely dangerous. But we're going to go on to the episode talking about when sexual abuse is not believed or even if it's hidden away from sight intentionally. Being sexually abused does horrific damage. So much of the damage lies in the unexplained, horrific idea that it's even happened. But two, when you're not believed if you try to tell or you're ridiculed or you're told it was your fault, this damage can be even greater. All three of the following people I saw and here are their very brief stories. Elena's father raped her almost daily since the age of eight And when she resisted around age 12, he pulled a gun on her. The abuse stopped only when she got old enough to leave the house more and bring friends home. But it didn't stop totally until she left for college on a scholarship that she'd done everything in her power to earn. It finally gave her some freedom. She said, I was a thing to him. She came to therapy because she could no longer manage the flashbacks that were beginning to occur. Ruth had been a 10th grade girl who was studying with a guy and supposed friend in high school. She was now in college. Suddenly he threw her down. You're going to enjoy this. She was stunned, lost, but she didn't scream. She got up and left the house and began having panic attacks. The third is Antony, a middle-aged man who was at a bar and someone put something in his drink. He woke up hours later, realizing he'd been anally penetrated. He just thought he was a guy talking with other guys. Now his reality was that he was half naked in a hotel room he didn't recognize and had vague memories of some kind of party. It was horrifying. All three finally decided to reveal. Elena told her mother, who looked away, and her sister said, Dad would never do that. 
Ruth went home that horrible night and told her mother. And these were her mother's words. You've been flirting with him all along, and you shouldn't have worn that skirt. Antony summoned the courage to tell his wife. And she screamed at him, I just think you went out and got laid. You probably have AIDS. Pack your stuff and get out of here. They were not believed. All of these conversations, by the way, had occurred before I saw them in therapy. And the damage those conversations had done was devastating. Elena, Ruth, and Antony had sunk into holes that were so deep, and it took some courage and monumental effort to get out. But in many ways, they had stopped talking, and therapy was about trying to re-engage their mind and their heart in conversations that had brought them so much pain. I want to stress that Elena, Ruth, and Antony are people that are sitting next to you at work. They are your neighbor, the mom you see every morning walking her kids to school, the corporate guy who has to travel for his job, who always seemed to be a great family man, but suddenly is separated from his wife, the person sitting next to you in class who suddenly has become more quiet than she used to be, the first person who they trusted to tell chose to stay in denial. They chose to keep whatever bubble they live in free and clear of nastiness, of calculated cruelty. They chose to protect themselves rather than you. They chose to keep their life intact while yours fell apart. I've been told by countless sexual abuse survivors that this experience can feel worse than the abuse itself. You're given the message that you're a liar or that you somehow asked for it, that it was consensual or planned. You're given the message that you're not important enough to be believed. Let's talk just for a second about some statistics. Most rapes never get reported. RAIN, that is a national organization in the United States trying to help sexual abuse victims, says 995 out of every 1,000 perpetrators will walk free. And Time Magazine ran a story more than a decade ago that showed between... 4% and 6% of children are physically abused each year in the high-income nations, such as the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, and Canada. As many as 15% are neglected, and up to 10% of girls and 5% of boys suffer severe sexual abuse, and many more are victims of other sexual injury. I've heard much higher figures, actually, and the problem is only getting worse. And it comes to our horrified attention with the Catholic Church scandal— Again, what we mentioned, the U.S. Olympic gym team scandal, the Penn State scandal, all of these reveal complex cover-ups that occurred and the fear that is instilled in their victims in order to keep their secrets. Here's one story. In 2016 in Great Britain, a courageous, mentally tortured former soccer player, we call it soccer, they call it football there, Andy Woodward came forward and revealed the details of how he was chronically victimized by Barry Bennell, a serial pedophile who was initially sentenced to prison in 1998, but had been Andy's soccer coach at Crew Alexandra since the age of 11. He says, I just wanted to play football. My mom and dad will say that I always had a football in my hands wherever I went. I saw Crew as a start of that dream, but I was soft-natured too, and it was the softer, weaker boys Bennell targeted. What he'd do sometimes to show the fear factor and make sure I never told anyone was to get out some nunchucks. He was a master with them. He'd tell me to hold out a piece of paper and I'd be physically shaking. Then he'd hit it with enough force to split it in half and make a little comment. You see what I can do? You see how powerful I am? The terrifying threats of you better not tell or are believed by the abused child, the abused teenager, the abused adult who hears them. And sometimes there is actual danger. The perpetrator has the capacity of hurting the child or the victim or the victim's family. And yet keeping the secret can be more burdensome and can lead to severe anxiety and depression. A victim can be triggered by even the slightest sound, smell, tone, or place for years after the abuse is over, feeling once again powerless and not at all in control. Let's talk for a second about male victims. They're far less likely to reveal because of several irrational beliefs about how being a sexual abuse victim may affect others' perceptions of who he is, or sadly, his own perception of himself. What are those irrational beliefs? 
that you're less masculine if you were abused, that your sexual orientation is not the same because you've been sexually abused, or it changes it. If you're sexually aroused during the abuse, that means your body responded. That doesn't mean you asked for it. And actually, you're not likely to become an abuser yourself. Only one-third of abused male children are likely to abuse. Now, that's a great cultural concern, but obviously two-thirds of males never perpetrate. I could not find the figures on female perpetrators for this episode, but I'm sure they're out there, and they're probably somewhat similar. It's tremendously healing to be believed. Let me tell you a story about it. I saw a woman more than, gosh, 15 years ago, and I saw her at a clinic that I worked for when I first moved to Arkansas. She told me in the first session that she'd been molested by her father. I listened carefully and tried to help her sort out her feelings about that. When she came in the second time, she looked at me and said, I have something even worse to tell you. She said, when I was nine, my father had to start bringing my baby brother in the truck and he would tell me the ways to molest my baby brother. She was crying. She looked at me and she said, I'm a terrible person because I did that. And I said, no, you were a child who was forced to do what your father told you to do. Then she called and canceled her next session. I called her back and said, what's going on? I'm a little concerned about you. You've obviously told me a lot. And she said, no, I'm a lot better. I said, well... Do you mind coming in one more time? Because I think we need to process more of what you may be experiencing. She walked in with a smile on her face, and these were her words. All I needed to let go of the shame was to be believed and not to see a look of horror on your face when I told you about my brother. I had believed all my life that someone would think I was a monster for doing that to him because I have felt like that, like a monster. When you're believed... When you're not blamed, when you recognize that you were helpless to do anything about what was done to you, that's a terrible feeling to recognize that level and depth of helplessness. But you were not in charge. Your perpetrator was. Your coach was. Your mother, your father, your grandfather, your neighbor. They took charge. I will share with you that Elena, Ruth, and Antony all decided in therapy to try again with their families. That's not always the case. I don't have an agenda about that because it's truly a unique experience. Elena's father actually died, and it was interesting to find out that she discovered that he was not her biological father. He was her stepfather, and he'd been taking out on her what was his rage with her mother. That obviously helped her understand and helped her family begin to come around to the idea and help the family understand what had been actually going on, that the man was a pretty good father to his own biological children, but was so enraged that he molested Elena countless times and was very cruel to her in other ways. Ruth actually talked to her father, who had not known any of this had gone on, and between her father and her, they reapproached her mother who was very sorry for her attitude. And actually, they worked together on trying to reconcile those hurts. Antony brought his wife in for therapy, and we talked with her about these irrational beliefs, and sure enough, she had believed some of those, or had the fear that perhaps her husband was gay, and that was not something that she could wrap around. Once those irrational beliefs were quelled, She loved Antony and wanted to be in his life and could have more compassion. It was just her fear getting in the way. So these are my last messages to you for this podcast if you've been sexually abused. If it happened to you and you didn't fight or scream, it's okay. You did what you had to do to stay safe. If it happened to you and you barely remember, it's still abuse and very important. Maybe you just have a feeling in your gut. There are a lot of people that don't walk around with that feeling because it didn't happen to them. If it happened to you almost every day of your life, it's not your fault. You deserve to have been loved well. If it happened to you and you were forced to hurt others, remember you were a child or you were disempowered. 
if it happened to you and your body somehow automatically responded, know that that could happen. If it happened to you and other people knew and did nothing, there's something wrong with them, not you. If it happened to you and no one believed you, then it's about their fear. It's about their confusion. It's about their denial. Again, they chose their life to stay intact while yours fell apart. Please take care and reach out for help. Tell someone who has the capability of understanding. Tell someone who doesn't avoid the painful things about life. Tell someone that has no investment in it not being true. You are not dirty. You are not a monster. Anyone can be a victim of sexual abuse. Anyone. The listener email today is from someone who's been reading about my concept of the syndrome of perfectly hidden depression and wanted to reach out to me. I've recently discovered your podcast. I was sitting at the office feeling down and upset with no way of explaining it. So I searched depression on the podcast app and you were the first one to pop up with perfectly hidden depression. I've been this way for as long as I can remember. The crazy thing is if you ask anyone that knows me, They'll say, she's the happiest person. I'm not sure how she does it. Little do they know, I'm not a happy person. A lot has happened in my past. My parents dismissed my emotional problems that I was having in school, and I moved on to an abusive relationship right out of high school. Then I found a man that I thought was the love of my life and married him four years later and got divorced within the first year. I truly blame myself for that divorce. I never noticed how bad I felt inside until recently. I constantly blamed him for how I was feeling, and that's another story on its own, but I did not understand what was happening. I've now been divorced for about a year and a half. I'm trying to move on. I'm currently seeing someone, but I'm still not happy with myself. I'm not sure why I feel this way, but I realize I've always felt this way. After listening to your podcast related to Perfectly Hidden Depression, it's starting to make sense. I took the survey on podcast episode three, and I scored 20 out of 26. I want to go to a therapist, but I'm not even sure how to go about that. I'm 28 years old, and my family has never spoken of getting help for mental issues. How do I find the right therapist? How do I explain to them that I can get up in the morning and go to work, put a smile on and pretend everything is okay, but deep down I've had scary thoughts? I've had these thoughts for years. I don't think I would ever act on them, but they come on more often, and nothing seems to trigger them. Thank you in advance for your help. So here's my answer. Perhaps your first step is to realize that you're among a really good company, although I can hear you're shaming yourself. Most people don't figure everything out by the time they're 28. I can tell you it took me until my early 30s to truly begin to put some pieces together. And that was with a few years of therapy. Don't get me wrong, I'm sad for you that your first marriage didn't work out, and I'm not discounting that in any way. But I'm glad you're moving on, although you still seem plagued by shame. You also seem to know that things are there, or you wouldn't have scored so high on the questionnaire, and you may have been denying or discounting them. So, it's time to work on you. Many people have written me about how to find a therapist. Many therapists have websites now that you can look at. Psychology Today's website has therapists there. Your primary care physician may have a suggestion. Actually, though, friends are the best resource. But, of course, you have to reveal to at least one person that you're struggling. But that, in and of itself, can be healing. I will say that the new book is just out, and it's available on Amazon and other sellers. So you might want to invest in a copy of that and a journal, for starters. Because if you've been hiding a long time, Coming out of hiding will have its own struggles. You're smart to not forge ahead with another relationship because you may risk making the same mistakes over again. It's time to make yourself a priority. Be honest with a therapist, even if you have to tell them that you'll be slow to open up, that you'll tend to discount and hide. You'll smile when you're really hurting, and it's not easy to reveal to yourself. Just tell them where you are, and if you find a good relationship with them, then it will be easier and easier to open up. It takes a lot of courage. Take very good care.
I'm very honored that you're here at Self Work. I know that there are a lot of places that you can listen to mental health advice, and the fact that you've chosen Self Work means a lot to me. Many people don't realize that I continue to see patients every week, about 30 of them, in fact. So this podcast, although very meaningful to me, does take some time, but I love doing it. I love hearing your responses and your reviews on iTunes or anywhere. Please continue leaving those. You can go to my website at drmargaretrutherford.com and subscribe there. That way you'll get my weekly blog post and podcast. It's a really easy way of keeping in touch. Feel free to email me at AskDrMargaret at DrMargaretRutherford.com, and I'll definitely write you back. It's taking me three to four weeks now to get back with people because I had to stop getting back for a while, but I'm back on it. And of course, I'd also be very honored for you to buy a copy of Perfectly Hidden Depression. I think it can help anybody, really, although the topic is perfectionism. The 62 reflections are reflections and exercises that I use with almost all my patients. And if you want even more contact with me, you can join my Facebook closed group at facebook.com slash groups slash self work. In fact, I'm doing a little Facebook live here in the next few weeks only for that group. It'll be on Perfectly Hidden Depression. People who are reading the book have questions that they want answers to. At least I'll try to provide answers. I'm on Pinterest, Instagram. There are plenty of places to find me. Well, thank you so much for being here. Take very good care. I'm Dr. Margaret. And this has been Self Work.